uh, he, he or she would tend to force the particular view upon everybody else and say, no, obviously it isn't what you say it is. Look, it's perfectly clear that it's that. So we are living in a Rorschach plot. Only urban people have difficulty in realizing it. Because urban people live in a straightened out world. And we call them straight or squares. Uh, because they think in very simplistic terms. The Euclid had a very simple mind. And uh, therefore he discussed the geometry, which wasn't a measure of the earth at all. It was the word geometry, so it's from the Greek geos, the world, the earth, geos, and metra, which means to measure. Now the Greek word for measure, from which we get metric, meter, comes from the Sanskrit root, M-A-T-R, which also means to measure, and derived from that is the Sanskrit word maya, which means illusion, as well as imagination. So figuring it out is the measuring of the world, the meter in it. And uh, meter also is the Greek word for mother, and is, of course, the root of the word matter, material. And so when we ask, does it matter, we are asking, does it measure up to anything? <laughs> well, we come to the conclusion that there is no matter. The form is so it's a form that matters, or you could say the universe is a matter of form. <laughs> and in Sanskrit, there is no word for matter. The word rupa, which is used for the material or physical world, means form. And so you get nama rupa as the full name for what we call physical reality. Nama means name, rupa form, so it is named form. And so Lao Tzu, writing the Tao Te Ching, says the nameless or the no name is the basis of heaven and earth. But the name is the mother of 10,000 things. So, uh, in the sense then of this, you can understand the saying, in the beginning is the word. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Because you don't get things until you start naming. Because then you point out on the universal Rorschach block, this wiggle. What do you mean, this wiggle? Where does one wiggle begin, begin and the other end? Well, this is a matter of arbitrary definition. Where does your head end and your neck begin? Here, 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 here. Well, where is it? We know vaguely. But you can't be precise about it. Because you can look at the head and the neck as continuous. Uh, you start here. You say, well, it's all one thing up from here to, to here, see? Or you can start here and say, no, it's all one thing from here to here, etc. Because it's all arbitrary. And uh, the value of it is that by description, and by conventional decisions as to where to draw the line, we can communicate in language. And this is socially valuable. But we must not be deluded by what we're doing. Because if we do truly believe that the world is a lot of separate things, we believe that we can take them apart and have this without that. And so uh, when you apply this state of medicine, 
and you get a medical specialist who knows all about the heart and nothing about the lungs. He starts interfering with the human body as if it were an automobile with replaceable parts. He says, well, we'll take this out. Just mm -hmm. so do a little mechanical work, get a wrench and a screwdriver and uh, so on, only the surgical equivalents. And we'll take this out. So there's a tumor. And we'll take it out. All right. If he's not terribly careful, a metastatic uh, consequence follows, that some of the cancerous cells will go, will go into the bloodstream through the cutting, and the cancer will spread all over the body. Or if you start fiddling around with people's glands and give them certain uh, medicines to stimulate this gland or to cool its operation in some way, you upset a balance which runs through the whole physical system. Exactly the same thing happens when you use DDT on mosquitoes. Well, it kills the birds. And the birds were eating the mosquitoes anyway. And so were the spiders. And you kill the spiders along with the mosquitoes. Or the fleas. And we find, in other words, that the natural universe is a very intricate system of balance. Which cannot really be split. Now, let's take the bees and the flowers. In a world of no bees, there's no flowers. In a world of no flowers, no bees. Because bees and flowers are aspects of the same organism or organization. They go together. So I invent the word goes with to indicate organic relationships. And we as human beings, obviously, we go with an enormous cosmos of geological, botanical, and zoological events. And we are entirely dependent on them. And we cannot treat them as really and truly separate species. The bees are as much a part of us as they are part of the flowers because we need vegetables and we can't have those without bees or other insects. So what we've got is a universe that all hangs together and where each so-called part of it implies all the other parts. Let's take what we call the holography. This is a method of visual reproduction that employs laser beams. Now, you can cut a small piece out of the photographic negative, just a tiny little square. And by holographic methods, you can reconstruct from that little piece the rest of the negative. It will be pretty clear in the middle place where you've taken out the um, tiny square, and then vaguer towards the edges. But it's all implied in that little square. Now, of course, uh, a photographic negative is a crystal. It's a structure of crystal. And the way the crystals are formed in that tiny piece depends on its original environment on the whole negative. See that? You, the way you are, depends on or goes with your cultural, social, and biophysical environment. So there is really and truly no way of separating out independent things. And this is difficult for people to understand because of our method of motion. A plant is understandable as something growing out of the earth because it's rooted. But human beings wander about on legs. We don't seem so stuck to things as plants do. And therefore we have delusions of separation. But what about the seed that comes from the plant? It's fascinating how plants have different methods of feeding themselves. They have little helicopters. They have burrs that stick in the fur of animals. 
they have fruit which is tempting to birds and other creatures to eat and they swallow the seeds and take them somewhere else and excrete them in manure all ready to go they have wonderful little fuzzy things of uh, cotton fibers so there's a seed in the middle which float through the air for miles and miles there is also an extremely ingenious plant that has pods and when the pods are ripe they suddenly break the pod twists itself each side of it into a spiral and the seeds are thrown way up we used to have one in our garden in England next to a wooden fence and every time it went crack all these seeds would rattle on the fence tremendous energy that it went up and uh, look at the whole process of pollination and uh, how extraordinary that is showing and arguing very high order of intelligence in vegetables so when we say of somebody he's a, you know, she's a vegetable a terminal cancer you know, that's a loss only become a vegetable this is a misuse of the word vegetable vegetables must be respected and people who do respect vegetables and who talk to them and love them somehow those vegetables respond and they become we say they have they have a green thumb so I think that we, we are living in an intensely interconnected universe only our language system has broken it up for purposes of discussion and we spend so much time in discussion that we form the false impression that the world is broken up in the way that language breaks it up and it isn't now I may know that theoretically as a scientist as a biologist or whatever be my approach but I don't necessarily feel it an ecologist the person who devotes a whole lifestyle to uh, realizing the interdependence of everything in the world is in private life still a Christian ego that is to say a separate soul inside his bag of body that's the way he feels and we have enormous difficulty in avoiding that feeling because of our social influence on each other now if you befriend say a group of Christians and uh, they may be Baptists and uh, for various reasons it's important for you to be a member of this group you will eventually think their way the most startling example of this was an experiment devised by B.F. Skinner he would be giving a class in psychology and he would suddenly send two students out of the room say come back when we call you then he would explain to the class the game rules. We're going to put two chairs here, up beside me. Chair A, chair B. We're going to have a discussion, and these two students are going to come back. We will agree with everything that is said by the student who sits in chair A. We will disagree with everything said by the student in chair B. The effect of this was astounding because even if the student sitting in chair A was rather inarticulate the fact that the group said every, agreed with everything he said made him extremely expressive and very happy however articulate the student in chair B where everything was wrong with him he got completely confused and the only way out was for the student either student to explain to the class the game rules that they were playing but you see they didn't know these rules and they had to be very clever indeed to deduce what was the pattern I once got into this situation uh, I had a group of students come and visit me 
with a faculty member in charge of him. And he was very obstreperous. He argued. He really wanted to argue. So I got the general drift of his argument, what sort of opinions were likable to him. And then said something that would entirely accord with that sort of opinion system. And he denied it. So I said, sir, you are playing the game. You are bound and determined to disagree with anything I say. And he was nonplussed. So, you see, we are under this tremendous social pressure because talking with each other is our principal means of communication. And so more and more it hypnotizes us. When you hypnotize a person, you do it chiefly by talking. Relax while I count up to five, you know, be very relaxed, etc. Oh, it's jazz. And, uh, so it is the word which spellbinds us. Look at that word, the spellbind. The victim of spelling. <laughs> <clears throat> and so all these conventions of language in which we think, even if we're quite illiterate, uh, illiterate people think in words just as much as literate people. Uh, in other words, an ordinary ignoramus is, is just as much, if not more, under the spell of words than an intellectual. Children, as soon as they are taught language, become absolutely clobbered by it and resent tremendously being called something, as I say, Johnny's a sissy. And children are absolute victims of the calendar. They want to know when it's going to happen. How soon is Christmas? How soon is my birthday? They want time to go in jerk from one festival to another. Because they are so poisoned by adult conception. They have no antibodies against them. So likewise, the, uh, the Japanese have no antibodies against Western culture. They are complete victims of it. They succumb to smog and even think it's a good thing to have smog. <laughs> have song about how the beautiful fog over the furnished buildings of the factories. Yeah. Haiku. No, this is true. I'm not kidding. In, in a nation of people that's supposed to be great lovers of nature. Japan is, is unbelievable. Go to a beach in Japan, and you think they would appreciate wonderful stretches of sand and rocks and the sound of the waves. The tide line of a Japanese beach almost anywhere around the island is a complete mess of plastic cast off Sun lotion bottles, condoms, uh, discarded sandals, uh, anything you can imagine, just a mess. Go to a, a, a natural beauty place where all the tourists go to look at the famous view, and the whole place is scattered with rubbish. Napkins, Kleenex, sandwich bags, cigarette packages, what have you. When you travel in Japan on the underground in Tokyo, one always imagines the Japanese are very polite. And in their own setting and in their own cultural context, they indeed are. But on a subway, everything goes amok. And people are crammed in like sardines. They even have special officials to shove the crowd into <laughs> into the train. And they cannot cope with the situation that is foreign to their cultural context. 
So this is the, the, what I'm saying is watch out for your social conditioning and how your constant commerce in language with other people shapes the way in which you actually sense the world. Now, we say seeing is believing. But it is truer to say that believing is seeing. There was a very marvelous scientist of optics by the name of Adelbert Ames who devised a whole series of experiments where you could go into a big room, say, and there were booths all around. And in these booths, there were exhibits that defied the laws of logic, not seem to. Uh, there was, for example, the marvelous experiment of the trapezoidal window. You make a window frame, one side of which is much longer than the other. See? Then you suspend this on wires in such a way that, the, that an axis is formed through the perpendicular center of the frame. And on this, the frame revolve. What you see is a window frame twitching like this. It's actually going round, but it seems to be twitching. Then you put a little cube on one upper corner and color it red. See, so it'll stand out. And you see this thing twitching, but the cube unaccountably going round. <laughs> then another experiment where you're in a dark room with a group of people. And a little bright light suddenly appears in front, very small. And the operator says, will those who observe any movement of this light please account for it and uh, describe it? So somebody says it's floating upwards. Somebody says it's now drifting off to the left. And all this conversation goes on. Then the lights are turned up. And it's shown that this point had never moved at all. It was the fixed light. So, there are all kinds of things. I mean, Ames only scratched the surface of what we see because we believe in it. We see what we want to see, or what we're supposed to see. And uh, are not really very aware of what's going on. Now, all stage magic is based on this. And this is why uh, one can learn a great deal about mysticism from stage magic. What the magician does is uh, he persuades you to see what you expect to see. But in the meantime, does something completely unexpected. Your attention has been misdirected. He says, look at this. I want you to look at it very carefully because we don't want any hope of focus around here. See? So I, I'm, I want you to examine this thing I'm showing you and be sure there's no hope of focus. So that when you understand the nature of stage magic, you think, God damn it, how simple that was. Why didn't I see? Why was I such a fool as I overlooked this idiotically simple trick? And the best trick for the simplest. And don't involve complicated apparatus at all. The best stage magicians are the ones who will stand in the middle of a crowd of people. You know, with no stage hocus pocus or wires or trapdoors or anything like that. And right under your nose, you'll use a pack of cards or a few coins to do things that flabbergast people focus. And all those things are extremely simple, once you know. And so that's very much like being enlightened, <laughs> having satori. When you get it, you think, oh, for heaven's sake, why didn't I see that? 
I mean, how obvious. But the difficulty in communication here is that Satori or enlightenment is very much like seeing a joke. And then you laugh. You laugh generally. But if somebody explains it to you, you don't get the same laugh as if you saw it that often. You get a throat laugh instead of a belly laugh. So that's why people are reluctant to explain too much about it. And rather use the method whereby you will see it for yourself and then laugh at what is the cosmic equivalent. <laughs> so therefore we are most of us in a state of hypnosis induced by the incantation of language the enchantment the spellbinding and uh, when one speaks of awakening, uh, as say in Buddhism, one speaks of the Buddha as the awakened one, it means, therefore, dehypnotization. Coming to your senses. But of course, to do that, you have to go out of your mind. <laughs> well then, What that involves, among other things, is an awakening to the true structure of your common sense. I once was invited to give an address before the American Psychiatric Association. It was a very funny situation because all the country had been supposed to give the talk, and he was sick. And so they invited me to come and give it instead. And it was on a very dangerous subject, on uh, the use of LSD. This was many years ago, this was in 1958, when LSD was just discovered. And uh, what was I going to say? Oh, they were horrified. Would I please meet with the committee? Because they didn't want anything to be said that would uh, somehow damage their scientific integrity. So here they were, anxious as all get out. <coughs> well, I said you invited me to hear the talk, and to tell you the truth, I don't know what I'm going to say. Because I never prepare anything in advance. I'm going to listen to what you have to say first, and I'll make up my mind. So I attended the morning conference. And one interminably dull paper after another was read, you know. And uh, most of them by psychoanalytically oriented people who were discussing mysticism in terms of regression. Regression to the womb. Regression to the oceanic feeling of the as yet undifferentiated infant. So, the papers went on and on and it was time for lunch. And everybody was hungry and bored. So I said to the chairman, he called me to the platform. I said, how much time? I don't know, let's make it 15 minutes. So I said to the group, now look, I know you're waiting for lunch, and this is not going to be another learned paper. There's going to be a few remarks off the cuff. We philosophers are very grateful to you, psychiatrists, for all your experience into the emotional and unconscious bases of our opinions. 
and our views of the world. And this has been extremely informative and interesting. Now, however, the shoe is on the other foot. We would like to inform you of the unconscious intellectual assumption underlying your psychiatric methods. You are all, whether you know it or not, product of the world view of the 19th century. And your ideas of the functions of the nervous system and of the uh, psychoanalytic process are based on Newtonian mechanics. Psychoanalysis is in effect psychohydraulics. Uh, because you talk about damming up things, you talk about repression, you talk about uh, the flow of, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, associate, free association. And uh, you talk about unconscious mental mechanisms. So it is clear that you are still in a Newtonian psyche and you haven't yet graduated to a quantum psyche. And so, uh, because of this, you have a theory which amounts to high dogma that the unconscious is stupid. And you call it libido, which is a cuss word. Libido means blind lust. And Freud used that word in parallel with Ernst Haeckel, who was a contemporary biologist, who thought that the energy of the universe was blind energy, despite the fact we have eyes. <laughs> so they all had a reductionist view that human life was a complication of a force that was basically stupid, ignorant, unconscious, and immoral. Well, they said, we can't be like the Christians and attempt to beat this force into submission because it's too powerful for us. But we've got a new wrinkle. What we're going to do is we're going to do it like we train a horse. Instead of whipping it, you give it lumps of sugar. And you, well, watch out, though. The Freud was scared stiff of the unconscious. He was a good bourgeois Jewish Viennese a uh, well-behaved person. Once upon a time, Freud and Jung went together to New York. And uh, Jung was uh, uh, delighted to walk down Fifth Avenue and see so many beautiful women. And he turned to Freud and said, goodness, how many beautiful women are out there? Why don't we uh, somehow arrange them to make a date for the night? And Freud drew himself up and said, you forget that, Doctor, I'm a married man. <laughs> so, uh, Freud always thought that the unconscious was not really very nice. Now, he had a contemporary by the name of George Grodek. And George Grodek is very little known in this country. And Grodek gave Freud many of his basic ideas. He, he used slightly different ways, where Freud called it the id, Grodek called it the it. And, uh, but Grodek had tremendous faith in the unconscious. He trusted it completely. And he wrote a book called The Book of the It, which is a series of letters to his niece which he signed Patrick Troll. And you know a troll is a goblin. And Grodek looked like a goblin. He had very big pointed ears that stuck out. And a kind of um, strangely weird but benign expression. And he had a sanitarium in Baden-Baden. And there he practiced massage for people who came to him for analysis and analysis for people who came to him. He was a completely wonderful man uh, because uh, everybody felt calm by him. 
They felt an atmosphere of implicit faith in nature and especially in your own inner nature. No matter what, there is a wisdom inside you which may seem absurd, but you have to follow. And so Keisling, Hermann Keisling, you know, who was a great Lithuanian philosopher, said nobody could possibly remind him more of Lao Tzu than Grodek. Now, if Grodek had got into Freud, it would have been a much better scene. But there was in all this, you see, in Freud, the basic mistrust of the unconscious. And this led to a quarrel with Jung. Because uh, Jung went down to a lower level of the unconscious, which he called collective, and found out that there was a patterning process here. Formative patterning process which contained all the wisdom of mankind. So, for example, if you say, well, it's a great pity that the American Indian culture is wiped out. A Jungian would say, I know it is a pity, but it's all still there in the depth of the psyche, and sooner or later it will all emerge again. Because this patterning is eternal. And we, in our modern life, we reproduce patterns, we reproduce rituals, we reproduce fantasies and myths, which can be discovered as having existed 25,000 years ago. Because your unconscious is time. And everything is there if you go hungry. But they were still a bit scared. I know some of the old Jungian analysts I used to know in New York were very uptight about fishing in the unconscious and said yeah true but there is also in the unconscious the primordial slime which is full of serpents and crocodiles and uh, the most things that give us the Hebrew people and if you're not very careful those things will come up and invade your consciousness. Also, there are not only serpents and crocodiles and all those creepy crawlers, as they <laughs> ghoulies and ghosts and long-legged beasts and things that go bump in the night. There's also the divine. And if you're not very careful, you can be inflated by the divine. You can suddenly have a mystical experience. Supposing you're a kind of a half miseducated person like most of us are who takes LSD and suddenly these unconscious contents come up and you discover your divine and you think you're God and you take on all these airs and graces I mean the people like Meher Baba who ran around him announcing that he was personally in charge of the universe and expected to be treated as such Well, we put such people in the milk pot. That's what they did to Jesus. That's intolerable. And Jung was right, in a way, when he said that is inflation. It is turning your ego into God instead of having God as your ego. Because you didn't understand. You have to, in other words. Obvious. If you are going to let up all these great images in the unconscious. You must be wise. You must know something about it, and not jump to silly conclusions and delusions. But you see, there was in Jung a basic trust. More than the creepy crawlers and the ghoulies and ghosts the our collective unconscious is a source of wisdom. A formative pattern which, if allowed to develop in the right way, would integrate the individual. So that all his conscious functioning would become like a flower. And you know how a flower is balanced. It comes out as a beautiful circle with a middle. And for some reason, as yet unexplained, 
When anybody wants to, wants to create a symbol of the divine, they don't use a human face, they use a fire or a star. The rose window, the lotus. When I think what I want, you know, I try sometimes to figure out you know, what I would really like to have. And I like to look at it. I eventually settle for a flower. That's why they bring flowers to sick people in hospital. Take a morning glory and look at it. Did you ever think of it? Well, they say in the Freudian explanation, you're using that as a substitute for a vagina. <laughs> Well, I say that's not an answer to a question. It raises a new one. <laughs> What's so interesting about a vagina? You see, the only thing my father and I don't agree about is sex. We agree about everything else, religion and so on. But sex, he's a old-fashioned. And uh, he said, nature makes this activity extremely pleasant in order that the species will continue so that we will be sure to go on. But you must be very careful not to do it just for the pleasure of it, but remembering the responsibility of continuing the species. Well, then we got the population bond. And is that going to be solved by chastity? I doubt it. <laughs> taking a rather realistic view of things. No, I don't think that the... When I ask myself, what is the point of continuing the species, you get back to the thing I was raising this morning about survival. Why do not? What's it about? Do you live to eat or do you eat to live? Personally, I live to eat. And I don't reproduce children, although I've done my bit on that, rather a little too much. But <laughs> I, I, I think that the point of having uh, life going on is so that we can have sex. It's a good thing in itself. It's like dancing. And uh, really communicating, loving somebody is a tremendously fascinating thing. I mean, what to do with an evening? Okay, you go to the movies and you watch other people loving each other. Why don't you do it yourself? <laughs> I very rarely go to the movies because my own life is more fun than what I see on the movies. Now, will you see what I'm doing? I'm ringing around a whole lot of subjects and ways of looking at certain topics which show us that it ain't necessarily so. Things are not necessarily what they seem. And So, we can get in the mood to be open-minded. Now, that doesn't mean that you're merely lax in your opinion. True open-mindedness is what I've tried to explain as mental silence. Of being able to be completely surprised by reality. And to observe that it is not at all what you thought it was, or what you were brought up to believe. And not to be afraid when you suddenly discover the obvious. Which is that the real you is not the ego, 
but the eternal center of the universe. Well, we'll take an intermission.